Well, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Stephen Edmondowitz. I'm the Interim Division Director of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at the University of Colorado. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, special lecture and webinar today. Uh, today, we are uh, honoring one of our esteemed colleagues, Dr. Joel Levine, uh, who has been a member of our family here at the Division of Gastroenterology since 1975. Uh, Joel did his training in New York and Boston before he joined us as a fellow. And he's had a very interesting career, starting initially as a clinician scientist working in micronutrient work, and then became interested in public policy, so much to the effect that he became a Robert Wood Johnson Fellow in the 1980s, actually had a very significant uh, impact in the public health policy in the United States regarding gastroenterology, particularly regarding colon cancer screening through his work with both the American Gastroenterologic Association and uh, the American College of Physicians, where he was actually a member of the Board of Regents. Joel has had a very impactful career at the university, holding many uh, leadership positions in both the division, uh, the Department of Medicine, and the school as an associate dean. Uh, he has been most impactful in the mentoring of our fellows, our faculty, and our students. And all of us have a tremendous part in our heart for Joel and how he's affected us in our careers and help us understand uh, the complexities of the, the academic medicine and the interactions uh, with the public and public policy. Uh, in 2011, he uh, transitioned to the Denver Health Facility and he's actually the director of the gastroenterology and hepatology section there. And it would give me great honor, not only to thank Joel for his tremendous career with us and for helping us, but also to introduce uh, Dr. Ed Havernick, who is the chair of medicine there and who has been working with Joel for the last decade. Um, thanks, Steve. Um, uh, and thanks for sharing Joel with us these last nine years. Um, he came here uh, with a belief that uh, specialty care for all um, should be the same, that uh, those who are uninsured, uh, underinsured, to have the same access to high quality specialty services that everybody has. And he, uh, in short, was able to achieve tremendous success in that area in a way that's been a model for um, all of us moving forward. Um, you know, in my mind, I think his success comes from three separate places. Um, the first was um, recognizing that building a strong team was important. He attracted a group of young, very talented, committed um, faculty here um, and uh, set them to work. His, um, you know, his style in doing so is something I think we can all learn from. He um, uh, you know, has an eye for talent and he relies on that and uh, hires good people. Um, he really thinks that uh, a leader should genuinely care about those he leads and um, live that. Um, he uh, described that as needing to have people's back every minute, um, and, it, and he, he just really did that. He uh, always asked more of himself than those around him. Um, I think the second thing um, that, that uh, we appreciate um, in his success here was his just very careful attention to uh, the details of operations and uh, logistics, um, getting a clinic to run, getting an outpatient, um, endoscopy service to run. Steve mentioned his strong belief in colon cancer screening and put into place a program that we never had here that we didn't necessarily think was possible to have here. Um, just with creativity and relentlessness and, um, and the words he used was just don't accept crap. Um, and he didn't. Um, and I think that the final part of, of what Joel has done here is to set an example for others for what can and should be achieved here. I know speaking for myself, a lot of what I believe we can and should be doing comes from uh, the example Joel set um, from his words. Um, uh, he just never really thought that uh, the, uh, working in an underfunded public institution was any excuse for anything less than the best. Um, uh, you know, he just kind of seemed like a prophet sometimes. And I, I, I thought about this a lot a couple of weeks ago when we had a meeting with the CEO who really wanted to unveil for us a, 
major initiative to uh, expand access to the community for specialty care here in Denver Health. And um, the, uh, it occurred to me that we were finally catching up to the vision that Joel's had for many years. Um, and so we are very uh, uh, appreciative of this lecture today being a small step to honor his contributions. Hey, great. So, hello everybody. Uh, I'm John Samet. I'm the uh, Dean of the uh, Colorado School of Public Health and I have the uh, pleasure of introducing our speaker, uh, Dr. Mandy uh, Cohen, uh, currently uh, Secretary of the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, Dr. Cohen is well-trained, a Cornell undergraduate, a graduate of Yale Medical School, a master's degree from the Harvard School of Public Health and clinical training at the Massachusetts General Hospital. I think in looking at her career, at least from my perspective, it's uh, still, uh, still short, but it's been full of big and very important jobs. They seem to be getting bigger. Uh, she uh, spent much of her career before moving to North Carolina with uh, CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, rising the Chief Operating Officer and Chief of Staff before moving to her present uh, position where she heads up a very large department, uh, 17,000 uh, employees. As if this were not a big enough job, uh, as with many of our jobs, suddenly we have a pandemic uh, as well, adding to what has to be um, done. Uh, our, she'll be with us till uh, about uh, 12.55. The Q&A will be moderated by my colleague uh, and chair of the Department of Health Systems Management and Policy, which is uh, co-sponsoring uh, this talk. So with that, let me turn to Dr. Cohen for her presentation, Improving Health Through Public Policy, a lecture in honor of Dr. Joel Levine. Uh, Dr. Cohen. Great. Well, Thank you, Dr. Samet, and thank you everyone who um, was organizing this lecture in honor of Dr. Joel Levine. And for um, before I launch into my talk, just to say a few, few more words, for those of you who don't know, I'm also uh, Joel Levine's niece. Um, so uh, his sister is my mother, and um, I have been, uh, and had the opportunity to have my career be influenced by him. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, his career and its influence on, on my trajectory. And then at the end, I'll come back to talk about um, my uncle Joel um, and him and, and our family a little bit. Um, I'm going to have the, the, uh, my slides today. I was going to have um, my, my special assistant Harrison's going to go through the slides. So if you're interested in doing that, so you can both see them while hopefully I, I, I talk at the same time. So, um, so to start off with the career of, of Dr. Joel Levine, I know that he is an incredible cl clinician and I'll say re I relied on him as I trained as a medical student, resident and doctor on all things GI. He, you can, uh, he, he is always up on the latest clinical um, research um, and as well as on, on the cutting edge. But I wanted to focus on, on his career on the public policy side um, because it, was, it has been so impactful for um, for so many, and I think it was mentioned early on. And I remember as a, as a kid going to visit Uncle Joel uh, in Washington, D.C. When he moved his entire family for a year to Washington, it was so important for, uh, you know, it was a, such an important thing for me to see that this was so important that doctors work in policy and help to work and improve uh, the, the, the system in which we practice medicine. It was really impactful for me as a kid to see that happen. And then, um, and then knowing the kind of leadership and success he had, not only in the GI space with the Committee on Public Policy, helping Medicare to get to a place where they cover uh, colonoscopies. I think it's just an incredible sea change for how we think about preventive medicine in the, in the country, but then his leadership at the American College of Physicians was really when I was in medical school and in uh, residency training and actually got to work alongside with him at the college, um, watching his leadership shape a national agenda, talking about access to care. Um, and I think that has played out in big ways in the national scale and in, in what his work he has done in the last decade um, at Denver Health. 
Um, and so that the kinds of policies that, that the American College of Physicians put into place around access became uh, the, the baseline of discussion um, for the Affordable Care Act, which I had the opportunity to lead and implement when I worked at the federal government. Um, and so uh, he's had impact on so many careers, but I wanted to just um, thank him personally for how much he's impacted my career. So the pictures you see here, obviously this is his picture at, at Denver Health, but I want to talk about that picture up in the left-hand corner, which is uh, with it, which is Dr. Levine uh, giving one of his many uh, important lectures, and that's my my grandfather. Um, my mom's ma, and then that's my mother standing next to him, and you can see me in the corner over there <laughs> as well. Um, and so, just to see the the uh, a number of decades ago, and then and, and current day. So, an, an honor to Dr. Joel Levine, and again, thank you um, to the School of Public Health, School of Medicine, uh, GI Department for having me uh, today. Okay, with that, I'm going to dive in and tell you a little bit more about North Carolina, but. Because I'm going to be talking about leadership in a crisis, I wanted to talk about the how how leadership goes in a crisis before we get into the specifics of COVID. Um, COVID is the one of the hardest things I've done professionally for sure, but I've actually had the unfortunate, op I guess, opportunity to lead in a crisis a couple of times. I I helped when leading uh, the Affordable Care Act implementation and importantly helped when uh, we, you may remember back when healthcare.gov didn't turn on. It's quite, quite, a, uh, quite a big uh, public failure. I was brought part of the team that was brought in to help um, uh, make sure that we could rehab that. And I had an opportunity to lead the health insurance exchange at the federal level uh, and before I, I took this uh, role here in North Carolina. So I have had that opportunity to lead in government in crisis um, at a couple of times, and, and I keep seeing recurring themes over and over. So let me just talk about the how you lead in a crisis, and then we'll talk specifically about what we've been doing here in North Carolina. And I liked this, this uh, picture here with a sea of corona, <laughs> coronavirus uh, below you, and really thinking about trying to lift your head above the horizon. Where do we need to go? How do I spot problems? Um, but that you have that team with you. Not, none of the progress you can make is without, without that, that team behind you. Um, and I'll talk about some of the important aspects of, of leading during a crisis. So the first one that I wanted to, to impart, if you're ever thinking about leading in a crisis, is to embrace transparency. I, I work in a fishbowl and you got to love that. And I think it's so important in a crisis to be transparent. And this is across the board, whether it's being transparent with the public about important data points so they can understand and uh, and uh, that understand the data you're looking at, but really understand the, the why behind the decisions you are making. And there are a lot of hard decisions we're making. So transparency, both in the numbers and the data and the science, but also in the why and help people bring, bring people along in that in that effort so they really understand you and, and the why. So transparency is really important, particularly at a time of crisis. When I think about running my team, transparency is incredibly important because we're all working hard, we're working fast, and if we don't understand what everyone else is doing and, and we're, we, we know how resources are being spent, how time is being spent, what data we're looking at and how we map that to our resources, if we don't get that transparency, we actually can't get a coordinated response. So number one for me is transparency. I'm a very values-driven leader and transparency is one of our core values uh, at our department. And so transparency, particularly when you're in the government space is so important. And I'll just leave you with like the transparency linked to, uh, I think is so important because I think it's the way you build trust. And I think in any crisis, building trust is so, so important. And I spend a lot of my time thinking about trust, tr building trust with the public, building trust amongst my team, building trust amongst healthcare stakeholders. Um, so trust is really important. And I think transparency underlies that, that building of trust. All right, the next takeaway on leading and change is to proactively communicate. This is me at a press conference, and frankly, that's where I'm running to at the end of this hour, is another press conference. Um, we do, I, at the beginning of the crisis, I was doing one every single day. <laughs> We've cut it back to now only two a week, which is still feels like a lot. Um, but it's really important to proactively communicate what's going on. But I always talk to my team, communication is not just about talking. 
it's about listening as well. So a lot of, of responding to this crisis has been about listening to feedback, understanding challenges, and then mapping your resources uh, to, to those challenges. So communication is so critical and it's so interlinked with, with transparency, right? You wanna be transparent and you're communicating about details. And I, as I go through the work of North Carolina, I'll talk about how we've tried to communicate and be transparent with our data. I go through graphs and charts every single week with our press corps. Um, and so we, right, I've gotten folks really comfortable with understanding data because that is driving our decision making. So really important to communicate and to listen. Then the third takeaway lesson before I dive into North Carolina is details matter. And what I mean by that is, is there's a, that, that I, I I see a lot of fantastically good ideas, but good ideas need to become reality. And there's an operational execution and the, the making that become the reality is so, so important. There's a lot of folks with really good ideas and if, if only good ideas Met, made it so, I, I, my job would be so much easier. But it is really those details that matter. And I like this picture because right, I know where we want to go and leadership is about knowing where you want to go. But in a crisis, it's also about helping your team with the details getting to that, to that end point in that vision. Because those execution details, otherwise you may miss that divot in the road <laughs> and then you fall in the divot and you don't actually make it to the other side, right? If you're not paying attention to the details as a leader. So I think the last thing I would say taking away of, in terms of leadership in this crisis is having that vision, having those good ideas, but really being able to help your team execute on the details it takes to make that possible. I'll go through a bunch of examples, but any contact tracing or testing is a perfect example. We all know that those are important things, but making a testing strategy a reality for an, a state of 10 million people is a huge operational lift. Um, we ha have to think about so many things and so many partners and really being a good leader to be able to get into those details matters with executing on those good ideas. So we always uh, appreciate the research and the data and the ideas because they drive our work, but it is the details that really matter. And if you're gonna lead in government at a time of crisis, you really need to be uh, th that detail-oriented kind of person. So those are, those are my three takeaways of the how do you lead in crisis. Focus on transparency, proactively communicate, and, and focus on operational excellence and execution and, and turning those, those details into, into, uh, into our reality of the vision. So that's a bit of the how. Um, we, we go about thinking about leadership in crisis. Now I want to talk a bit about North Carolina. So that could really be for anything. But let me talk about North Carolina, what we've tried to do um, during this pandemic. So first, for those of you who don't, North Carolina, oh, I'm sitting behind the North Carolina flag, which you see on the, on the, the screen here. We're the ninth largest state. We are purple, and I mean that in a politics sense. I work for a Democratic governor, but we have a Republican-dominated General Assembly, State Assembly here, um, and so that means very divided politics. We're, we're a very um, uh, divided electorate. The, go the governor who I work for, Roy Cooper, was only elected by 10,000 votes, um, so right, very, um, very purple. And I think that has, has some really positive strengths and some really hard challenges. We're also very both urban and rural. We're a very we're an agriculture-based state, um, but we also have urban urban population density. We're extremely racially diverse. So with all of the important conversations going on about racial equity, um, that that has definitely been an important conversation we're having here, as well as thinking about the historically marginalized communities and the disproportionate impact of of COVID. So important for our for our state. Um, sadly, black eye for North Carolina is we do not have Medicaid expansion. I think that has been a, a hand behind our back in trying to fight COVID. So no Medicaid expansion, which means a higher uninsured rate here. And we also have a very decentralized public health infrastructure. I put a map on here so you could see all 100 wonderful counties of North Carolina, but 100 counties in a state our size is a lot of counties. Compare that to a California that has 55, 56 counties. They're way bigger than us, half the number of counties. So we're highly decentralized and we have 83 local health departments that do, do all feed up to my department, but it's still very decentralized. So when you thought about even communicating from a data perspective, that decentralization really was challenging right at the beginning of this pandemic. 
All right, so that's North Carolina, but how has our response gone so far? So um, overall, moving to the next slide um, of our, our response, North Carolina has done pretty well. I'm, I'm actually very, um, very proud of the work. And we've, and the numbers show it. Um, we avoided the first surge that the Northeast saw. So when the Northeast was really on fire, um, we went into lockdown. We spent all of that time building up our, our response capability. And then when the South got on fire this summer that we saw Texas, Arizona, Florida, Georgia, when they started to be on fire, we were not. Um, we did have a rise in cases um, in the July timeframe, but we never strained our healthcare system, never got near that. Um, and we have really um, avoided any surge. Uh, I, I attribute that to our very data-driven approach. Um, uh, the governor is incredibly, um, uh, um, uh, has been slow and cautious in his decision making. He is very data driven. We were one of the first states to do um, a, a statewide mask mandate. We continue to restrict mask gatherings and we have a huge public messaging campaign around face coverings and masks and the importance of them. Um, and so we, you know, that, that, is, that is a challenging place um, in, a, in a purple state and, and as electoral politics have, have played out, you definitely see um, changes in compliance uh, in, in face coverings, which do, does make uh, um, responding to this pandemic um, more challenging in, in certain parts of our state. Um, but I'm also proud of the kinds of response capabilities that we built over the last six months. As I told you, we, we were very decentralized. We had to build whole cloth response capabilities. We built our hospital surge capacity. We built an entire PPE purchase and distribution mechanism, our entire testing infrastructure, right? Remember back, this is Colorado too. There were no COVID tests back in March, right? We had to build that from scratch with all our labs, with, with entire uh, infrastructure data. Right, I said we are a data-driven approach, which means we actually have to collect high-quality data that we can synthesize to help us make decisions. That didn't exist in March. We had no mechanism to collect lab data and, and other hospital data that we built whole cloth. So my data team, uh, hats off to them, have been working hard and are still working hard. Frankly, it is still a challenge to mature our data reporting. We have um, we have a very extensive public dashboard. Colorado, I want to uh, say we look at Colorado's dashboard a lot as, as um, another very good um, reporting dashboard. We work really hard at being transparent and putting a ton of data out for the public to help follow along with us and understand. And I'll show you a little bit on our public communications campaign where we put um, a, a sizable amount of money behind uh, campaigns to help remind folks about face coverings and social distancing and more. So that's that's in a nutshell about our um, about our response effort. And so let me just talk now about the overall how all of those pieces fit together for us. Um, and the the public health folks amongst us will will know that we need to do when you have a certain level of spread of virus within your community, you're not just doing case based containment, right? You can't test your way out of this. You have to really focus on broad mitigation strategies to prevent the viral spread in the beginning. So we're doing both. We're doing both that broad prevention mitigation work, but we're also doing a lot of case based containment, but we're doing it in a very targeted way. Undergirding all of this is a focus on historically marginalized populations. In North Carolina, um, Latinx and Hispanic uh, uh, population is about 9% of our population. They represented 43% of our cases at, at one point back in July. So 9%, 43% of the cases, so huge amount of spread in our Latinx Hispanic community. African American, they are about 22% of our population, but what we were seeing, they were close to nearly 37% um, of our deaths. So their, their case rate was actually a little more comparable to their population size, but we were seeing our African American population um, have much more severe sequelae of disease um, and, and die. Um, and so that was obviously very concerning. So we have really focused our efforts as we think about both mitigation and case-based containment on, on a population, um, a health equity population. And data, data, data. I keep saying that, but data has so much been the, the backbone of how we make, make decisions. So with that, let me just show you our data. So this is what I'm about to do in our press conference in, in, a, in a few minutes. I will go through these four key metrics that we go through every week with our, um, with our press corps. It's on our dashboard. We do surveillance data, which is in the top left. We do case reported by day. So these are new cases. 
We look at tests that are positive and we look at hospitalizations. You'll note I don't use death as an, as an indicator here. I think death is, is a, it's a lagging indicator. It doesn't really help me make decisions. If I'm making decisions based on death rates, I feel like we're, we're too late. So these are the metrics we really look at. Um, we really do try to look at them in combination uh, as we go. And we have been looking at them with the press every week, uh, probably since the third week of April. Um, so long term, again, transparency and communication. Uh, next slide. A little bit more on some of the prevention efforts, right? This is the bulk of where our, our efforts have been, has been in public engagement and a lot of guidance. We are still in a place where we are, we have a number of businesses that are still closed. We have restrictions we, uh, in terms of social gatherings. Restaurants are at 50% capacity. Bars are closed completely. Our large venues are closed. Um, our gyms are open at 30%. Those kinds of, that, that is sort of where we are as a state. Uh, as I said, we have a, a statewide mask mandate. We have higher ed guidance, which I, I will say did not work. Um, let me just say, as a, we had to, we opened some of our higher ed uh, universities and they immediately closed. Uh, Chapel Hill, UNC Chapel Hill being one that made national news. Um, so we learned a lot from that and we have then implemented that across other universities. But, you know, we have not been perfect in this and there's a lot of challenges. And then we are already planning for the COVID vaccine. Next slide. Um, just a few things that we uh, that that my uh, brilliant communications staff came up with the three W's back in April. Um, wear, wait, and wash. And we've been. I am the three W's lady. Literally, people stop me in Target and say, "Aren't you the three W's lady?" Yes, I am. Uh, so we talk about the three W's a lot. Wear, wait, and wash. Again, repetitive, simple messages. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Um, next slide. We've also uh, launched a very large uh, public campaign to really get at, at why is it important, not just wear the mask, right? It, it's one thing to say, wear a mask, wear a mask, wear a mask. What we wanted to try to get to is the why. Why, why are we asking you to change your behavior? Um, and so we did this campaign, or whatever your reason, get behind the mask. We did it in Spanish and English. These, these are North Carolina. Carolinians who gave us. It's a wonderful, it's lovely. Um, it's one of our uh, new, new campaign efforts and it builds upon the three W's, right? We said three W's. Now we're saying, trying to help folks get behind their intent um, because we, we have seen from our focus group research, if you can help folks understand why you're asking them to change their behavior, they're a lot more likely to, to do it. Again, communicate, listen, right? We listen to focus groups that help us build, uh, build this. Um, and again, trying to really explain folks why you're making the decisions that you're doing. Next slide. So to get to some of our case-based containment strategies on testing, that this has been core and really important. And, and if the governor were, were, were sitting here, he would say, we are not at our goal yet in terms of the amount of testing he wants to see us do. We're about, we average about 32,000 tests a day. He wants us to be closer to 40,000. And so we are shooting in that direction. And you'll see this is a major funding commitment for North Carolina. We've committed um, more than $200 million of our CARES dollars just to testing. Um, we've done a combination of, of mechanisms to target testing. We've done sort of blanketing testing across populations and have that access. But then we did, as you see in this, what we called CHAMP, we really prioritize testing in zip codes that have high density of our historically marginalized communities. So people who are from the Latinx community, from the um, African American communities. We went into their community, we partnered with whether it was faith-based communities um, or whatever community organization would have us to do events. Sometimes we went directly to a construction site if that was where we needed to have the testing done. Um, so tried to be highly mobile, highly targeted, um, probably at this point more than 500 free testing events in historically marginalized communities uh, to this point. So testing was a, was a huge component of what we were doing. Next slide is on case investigation and contact tracing. Also important, but this super re resource intensive. This is a super resource intensive, particularly when we had high levels of spread everywhere. It is really hard to match that level of spread with, with your workforce and what you needed. Um, but we surged, I think we're over 20, 2,500 people doing contact tracing um, at this point. And we, we are just launching a new app that we are, we're encouraging folks to download. It's one of the Google apps that's being supported now. We're calling it Slow COVID NC. Um, and we've launched it in our higher ed populations. Again, another tool to help 
folks uh, be able to know if they were exposed early, has all the private privacy, safety, uh, bells and whistles that you would want. Um, so it, it's completely anonymous, but it does allow you to know if you've come into exposure of someone who has who is known to have COVID. So that that is something new we're, we're deploying here. And then lastly, we, we can't just ask folks to get tested and expect them to be able to comply with the quarantining or the isolation they need to. So we had to think very hard about how do we help people if they have COVID stay home from work or if they've been exposed to stay home from work because we were hearing all the time, understandably so, hey, if I miss work, I can't pay rent at the end of the month. If I miss work, I could lose my job. So we needed to meet people where they were. And so on the next slide, we did a lot of work to help folks think about how could they isolate successfully. Um, and this is work that is still just maturing here in North Carolina, but we needed to have pl a place for folks to go if they felt like they didn't have a, an ability to, to isolate at home. We have a lot of migrant farm workers here in North Carolina, so that was particularly important for that population. But then we had to, we had to actually put resources behind wraparound supports. So we're doing COVID payments to help people stay home, wage replacement if they need to stay home. Um, uh, also food delivery, they need to stay home, transportation to medical visits or what have you. Um, so we put some dollars now, because of the, the nature of the dollars, we targeted again to historically marginalized communities um, that we know were struggling more with this. And one of the great things that North Carolina has built over the time that I was here as, as secretary is that we have created an infrastructure that has linked together our healthcare world and all of those community organizations that help people, um, wh whether it's with food access or housing concerns, into a platform called NC Care 360. This is something we started to build in a public-private partnership well before COVID, but I think it has been an amazing tool to allow us to respond to this crisis. Next slide. This is sort of a little off topic, but just a little promotion of North Carolina. I'm just very proud of being the first statewide coordinated network um, that, that has this platform that unites health and human services. And for us, it has really allowed us to navigate people to the resources they need. I think we often all are in our silos. We in our medical space do our medical health care thing. And then the domestic violence shelter and the food bank and, and the, the faith-based community organization, they're kind of operating in a different world, even though it's the same people that we're helping. This is, this is the embodiment of breaking down silos, this platform. So I'm really excited about it. You can read more about North, Car North Carolina's NC Care 360, but li little just uh, plug to say that that has really helped us. All right, as I wrap up here, just a little bit about some of the lessons learned. So my takeaways as I try to step back and think, you know, uh, 2020 was quite a year. <laughs> I think we can all, um, uh, you know, recognize that this has been just such a challenging year. But if I think about some of the opportunities that this crisis has brought us, um, they're here on this slide. And I wanna make sure as we respond and recover from this crisis that we do take the opportunity. Because if we build back just in the same way we were, we won't build back stronger. So there is opportunities. And so my three takeaways for policy in the future, um, and again, I'm still, we're still in the midst of it, so bear with me here. These are the, my, my three. Again, continuing to hear this theme about, about equity. I feel like a lot of us, and myself included, we spend a lot of time admiring the problem. And, but what I mean by that is like we're measuring the problem. We knew there was a problem. We've been talking for a long time. We, we have um, health equity issues um, in our system. Um, and we've been focused on measuring it, but we gotta do more than measure it. And we've tried to, in our response effort to COVID, to say we're gonna do more than measure it, right? We're seeing the disproportionate impact so that we're gonna, we're gonna do something about it. We're gonna map our resources differently. We're gonna deploy things. We're gonna spend money. We're gonna do things differently. But there's a lot more we need to do in this space. And so we're undertaking a, a real, you know, a, a look across all of our programs to say, how do we do this differently? We just, we, we are, we are not making the kind of progress that I think we need to make in the equity space. So that's one, one lesson learned. The second is about building systemness, right? I talked to you when my, about North Carolina's need to build all of these response capabilities. 
it's because we don't have a system, right? It's because we don't have a system that is already in existence that allows us to have that response. We don't have data integration across silos. We don't have the kind of visibility and transparency um, in terms of what the system is doing and how we communicate. It was even hard for us to get a message out to all of our doctors here in North Carolina. We went through the medical board, which is fine, but it's just, it's a lot of effort to think about our system being coordinated. And I think that has a lot to do with our payment system that has driven the silos that we now see, right? People organize themselves by the, the payment silos. And so I, we did a lot of work before COVID on thinking about how can payment systems drive systemness and drive integration. And I think that we need to take this moment and opportunity to think about how we, we recover from this in a stronger way to build more systemness um, for, for our communities. And then the last one is about care beyond walls. And by this, I mean more than telehealth, because if, if all we learn from this is we're, we can all do telehealth, I don't think we've succeeded. Yes, telehealth should be part of routine access to care. And I hope in five years, if we're, we're having conversations about this, if we're still calling it telehealth, we have failed. We don't call it telebanking. It's just banking, right? But I hope it's just going to be a way we access care in the future. But it's more about more than just telehealth when I say care beyond walls. I, I hope that we are we can build back where care is also thought about more broadly. It is, yes, about access to medical treatment and doctors and lab, labs and, and imaging and, and pharmacy, but it is also about what other things drive health. And we need to make sure we are thinking broadly about what drives health, and that's going to be beyond our walls of clinics and hospitals. Um, and, and goes back to embracing this whole person approach to health. So we got to think about equity, got to think about systemness, and then we have to think about care beyond walls, both from a telehealth access perspective, but about health more more broadly. So that's that's my take. That's that's a very quick on what do I think about how you lead through change. A little bit on how North Carolina has approached this crisis, and a few takeaways on how I hope we can learn some lessons here. But let me just close with another few words about. Um, about my, my uncle and now maybe more on the personal side here. So these are more pictures of our, of our family uh, here. So, um, and, and, and yes, they're not that flattering pictures of me, I understand this. So, but this is um, pictures of Joel. Um, the, the two top ones are from times when we were kids and those are some, my, my cousins and Joel and Joel and my Aunt Frida um, and their kids, uh, Dan, Steven and Karen. And so we always loved being together as kids. And in the picture on the your left-hand side, you can also see um, my grandparents, um, Mike and Sophie, um, who were just pillars of for for our family. I actually named my my first daughter after my grandmother, Sophie, Joel's mom. Um, so we we're a tight tight family, um, and just continue to um, you know just want to honor. Um, the life and love from from my uncle Joel, and then you can see the picture on the bottom is from. I was so glad that I got a chance to visit Colorado back in February. We didn't know that COVID was coming, but I'm so glad my family and I were able to make the trip. You can see some of my cousins there. You can see my uncle Joel, my aunt Frida, myself. That's my cousin Stephen, his wife Abby, um, my cousin Ross, who is uh, my cousin Karen's uh, husband. So Dan, Dan and Lauren, sorry, you were over in the East Coast at that point for that picture. So sorry, you didn't make it for that one. But, um, you know, I am just so honored to be uh, um, the niece of uh, Dr. Joel Levine. He has influenced my career, but he has really been a, a source of support and strength to my mother and our family. And we're so grateful to have him in our life. So thank you again for, for this honor, um, for letting me join as a lecturer. And Uncle Joel, I love you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Secretary Cohen. Uh, very en enlightening uh, perspective you shared with us today. We're so fortunate to um, uh, have this time to, to learn from your experiences. Uh, we do have some time for uh, questions and answers. Um, and so, um, I will moderate our Q&A portion. I'm uh, Glenn Mays. I am professor and chair of the Department of Health Systems Management and Policy, one of the departments in the Colorado School of Public Health. 
Um, let me encourage those of you who are with us online, um, if you can use the Q&A feature, um, there's a Q&A box down at the bottom of, uh, of your screen. You can click on that uh, to submit questions. Um, and I encourage you to do that. I'll keep an eye on that and um, we'll get through as many of these as we can today. Um, I guess I'll take the moderator's privilege in, um, in asking a, a kickoff question. Uh, Dr. Secretary Cohen, you um, ended your talk with a number of kind of lessons learned and, and um, thinking about directions for future policy change. And we, we've all been hearing the um, familiar saying that never let, a, never let a crisis go to waste here in terms of windows of opportunity for large scale policy change. As you think about where we need to make progress in terms of health equity, in terms of building systemness, as you talked about, and payment reform, are there, are there some specific policy strategies that you're uh, pursuing now in terms of thinking about a window of opportunity um, for, for change, either within the state of North Carolina or, or nationally with your colleagues around the country and the secretaries of health? Yes, thanks, Dr. Mays. So we, we are definitely trying to put into practice right now some of these thoughts about equity systemness and, and care beyond walls. So within my department, I, I also oversee the Medicaid program. And so using that payment lever as a tool, um, one, we have completely changed all over how we pay for telehealth. So that's, that's a good baseline. We will continue that well beyond uh, this crisis. That's not a thing just for this moment, but we'll continue beyond. So that, I think that's like a minimum baseline. We were already at a place where we were stratifying metrics. So we were pretty understanding of, uh, of the quality inequities within our within our populations, but then you have to put real consequences behind. Well, if we don't meet quality metrics, uh, that that you there have to be some consequences. So those are the kinds of things that we are are implementing from a payment perspective. But we also some of the other things is that we have to get serious about this is a combination of systemness and and whole person care. I'll go back to the NC Care 360, that tool to link together healthcare and human services. I never thought that it, I would talk about a technology platform to help us that because I'm, you know, you know, EHRs are such a hard part of our of our lives now in clinical medicine, but it is it is a great tool. What it does is embed into EHRs, and then just how you would refer to a cardiologist or, or a GI doctor. Um, you can refer to a food bank and then actually know if your patient got the got to the food bank and what did they get. So same like you'd want a feedback from your specialist, you get a feedback from that human service organization. So you know what your patient is, is getting in terms of resources, but you also know what partners out there that are strong. Um, so we accelerated NC Care 360. We were actually meant to implement it over a number of years. We actually accelerated that during COVID. And again, now we have that as a foundation, how do we use that as a tool to build upon it? So as we think about the kinds of equity investments, we're going to have to think beyond hemoglobin A1Cs. And, and yes, that's important, but we have to think about food deserts and access to um, you, you know, transportation so, and, and to schools that are, right, it, it's the whole package of thinking about folks. And now that we, now we have a tool that can help folks navigate some of those resources. So I think those are the, some of the ways. So I am very much articulating sort of a, a vision to my national colleagues as they build, you know, as they think about, well, what should the next four years look like no matter what administration is there? I hope that they embrace this larger vision of health as we as we respond and to use both access to care as well as the human services side to make sure we're driving towards towards health fantastic thank you um we got a question coming in picking up on your comments earlier secretary coming about the going about the uh, complex political environment that you operate in in north carolina and that we find ourselves in nationally in terms of um polarization how from your perspective how can we stay the course in terms of letting science guide and data guide um, guide our future directions in, in this complex political environment? Well, so one, I, a word of warning. Um, I, am, I am very worried about weakening of trust in, in our government health institutions. Um, 
And I do want to say out loud that I have interacted personally with the career officials at FDA, particularly around what they're doing related to vaccine and some of the scientists. And I want to say that I am very, I, I think they're doing terrific work and I'm very pleased. Now, if they go in the wrong direction and something we don't like in the future, that's the time to get worried. But preemptively discounting things and calling things into question before there's the, the science and the data to know exactly where we're headed. So I'd encourage everyone to make sure that we are stay focused on the science and the data. I encourage my colleagues at FDA to, to really embrace transparency, right? Help us all be able to see the same data you're looking at. Hold public meetings. Make sure that we can uh, infuse confidence in steps forward because vaccination rates were always low in the United States. We need, to, and, and as you think about it, that is an equity issue as well. We really need confidence in our government at all levels. So, uh, you know, I, I want when when things are wrong and people are 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 inappropriately, you know, going against science, you call them out. But let's make sure not to do it before before there's a thing. I, I've been encouraging my team here to make sure that, particularly on the vaccine front, that we all. Um, you know, really uh, watch the scientists, let give them their space, do their job, but let the regulators do their job. And at least from what I have seen um, from the FDA perspective, I'm pretty pleased with that. Um, I do think it's important for the academic community when people deviate from the science for the academic community to call them out on it. Right, um, and that's happening right now with masks, right? We had the, F we had the CDC director yesterday who couldn't have been more clear, Trump admission uh, official, masks work evidence works, right? And then you had the president directly contradict him hours later. Not okay, need the academic community to, to rally around our government officials that are embracing uh, science. Maybe they were a little slower than I'd like to on, on, on some things, but embracing the right science. Uh, so that that's where I think the, those in the medical community, academic community can really be important, but don't, don't do it before, <laughs> don't discount and, and so, so doubt you know, if there's a problem, let's call them out on it. But I think trust is really important at this point. Excellent advice. So another question I think inspired by the, uh, by the career of Dr. Levine that we just heard about, um, how can physicians in particular support uh, government health officials in helping to build and promote that systemness that you talked about earlier? Yeah, great question. Um, so one is be involved. Um, and so, uh, it, and it can't be just about you know writing papers from 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 the sidelines. I think getting involved in organizations like the 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 college, whether it's the AMA or the college or whatever your specialty society, I think being involved in that is really important and being engaged um, and understand how powerful your voice is um, in in this debate. And, and I hope we when we as physicians talk to whether it's the press or to elected officials, I hope we're always doing it. From a perspective of how does of our patients that we are seeing and that and and the science that we have studied, um, so I, I would just say really get engaged and involved. Write write a letter to the editor. Write an op-ed. Um, get involved in uh, local government. Uh, they they need the support, but but also make sure that you're participating in these societies that, that are at the national level because they really do influence policy. I'll tell you, I was you know at a Fed for seven years and very much interacted with all of the major medical um, societies um, and very much take into account the public policy work that, that they do. So those would be my two, two thoughts there. Wonderful. Uh, an another question, um, based on, on your experience in, in leading in a, in a crisis um, that, that we're, we're involved in now around, around COVID, how, how do we, um, uh, make progress on the, in responding to the crisis without losing ground on other aspects of public health work that are, um, you know, that are un unrelated to the crisis. How do we balance attention to solving, responding to the crisis versus yeah. making progress on these other um, longstanding issues? Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that that question up. It's it's a really hard one, and you might not like my answer um, because you can't do it all. Right, particularly in a crisis, I will just tell you, we have had to marshal resources, not just from public health, but across my entire department in order to be able to, right, and there are only so many hours in the day and so many people and so many dollars, and it means you have to make choices. And that's, that's part of leading, 
is, is that prioritization and making choices. So it means that some things on our public health list that we know we want to do, that we want to spend time and effort and that in a crisis, you know, fall down the list um, a bit. Uh, and I, I, I think that is hard. I think it is going to mean that we're going to have a, re a recovery time to build back some of those really important things once we get through this crisis. But we've had to leave some of those behind. And I, I think we should just acknowledge that. I don't think that, is, that means it's a failure. I think you always have to prioritize. And, um, you know, I will say that has been very hard for my public health team, right? So for someone, I'll give you an example. I had to move my team that was working on chlamydia and syphilis over to a different infectious disease because this is the crisis of the moment. And it was very hard uh, for, for folks to, to leave that work behind. It was hard for me to make that choice, right? How do you say that that's not important as well? Um, but, but it is a hard time. We have to make choices and priorities. And it does mean that we, we once we are past this crisis and in a little bit more of a maintenance and mature state, we have to remember to go back and pick up some of that important work. Fantastic. Another question, thinking specifically about the physicians and their importance to the healthcare system. Uh, we know we have persistent um, uh, shortages and maldistribution of health workforce in general. Uh, state like North Carolina, mentioned the rural urban um, issues there. Um, any, any thoughts about how to make progress on those kind of longstanding issues of shortages of, of physician workforce and healthcare workforce in general, as well as dealing with the, the distributional inequities? Yeah, this is where I'm very hopeful. I don't think we've cracked the code here by any means, but I'm hopeful where, as we mature our telehealth, as I said, just calling it health, um, our health um, access points through um, technology that that we can we can overcome some of those those barriers, but that means we have to actually invest in broadband, right? It, if you're actually going to get to your rural communities, you need to have broadband there so that your doctors who may be sitting in a an academic urban center want to reach those communities by telehealth. There has to be broadband access on the other side. And actually, Governor Cooper. Um, has has put millions and millions of dollars into broadband in a public-private partnership here in North Carolina. So that is very much a top priority for us, not just for health, but for business infrastructure and for to, for rural prosperity overall. Um, so you know that that's not a perfect th that alone is not the silver bullet, but I think that that is a very important component to shoring up um, some of the those access points um, as we go as we go forward. Fantastic. And I know we're, we're running short on your time. You've got a busy day yet still to get through. Uh, but maybe one more question, a question in from some of our colleagues at Denver Health, um, asking about the um, strategies you mentioned in North Carolina to provide income supplements and meal delivery and transportation to meet some of those social, uh, unmet social needs. Um, are there any early data on outcomes for those kind of programs where you're connecting health and social service needs? Yeah, what a great question. The short answer is not yet. Um, we're t I think we're still too new. I hope that it can be um, something that can generate data and I hope to be able to share with, with other states and others who might be interested. We, we, I should let you know that we have been working on this kind of a project for many years. We're actually have embedded some of, of, of these concepts in our Medicaid program, where we are trying to use Medicaid dollars to pay for some non-traditional medical things like transportation or housing improvements um, or uh, other types of income supplement in, within the parameters of Medicaid. Um, so we use that learning and that that work that we had done in the Medicaid space and brought it over to this these programs in COVID. So there was a lot of evidence base for what we decided to cover in Medicaid. And so when we built this program for COVID, we used those set, same evidence-based uh, uh, um, uh, interventions. So, but I would say those, those that evidence base is very is very small meaning that it's small pilots, small scale, and we're trying to take some things to scale. Um, and so I think we still have a lot of evidence to generate as we take some of that to scale, but stay, stay tuned. And I've already told our team that we, we're gonna be you know, collecting a lot of data on this so that we can talk about how did it impact our communities and did it actually slow the spread? Did it actually um, prevent community, you know, further community transmission? So I think still 
stay tuned. Fantastic. We, we certainly will. Uh, Secretary Cohen, uh, the work you're doing in North Carolina offers uh, a lot of a lot of inspiration and guidance for us right here in Colorado. So we will continue to keep an eye on um, what you're doing and many of the innovations you described today. Thank you so much for making time for this. Thank you to our colleagues at the uh, University of Colorado School of Medicine and at Denver Health. Um, it's, it's really great to be a part of the celebration of uh, of Dr. Levine's career, um, and uh, we look forward to continue to learn together. Thank you so much. Thank you.